thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everybody. Um, welcome, now that there are actually people in this room, uh, to the last day of, of PyCon UK. I'm happy to see so many of you here because I really don't want this conference to end either. It's a credit to the wonderful organizing team who did a tremendous job here. And thank you so much for all your work. Um, a couple of notes just ahead of time. Um, these slides are highly illustrated. They are mostly images, which are placed in the public domain by the British Library. Um, my slides are online at my homepage. Um, so if you can't see images or can't see well, they're there with alt text, although currently very large. Uh, so the conference Wi-Fi might uh, make them load a bit. Um, also, I'm from Germany. I'm, I'm here as a guest. Um, I'm talking about history, as the title gives away. Some things that I'm mentioning might sound like they are a reference to or can construed be as Brexit commentary. They are very much not. Please take them in the spirit I'm offering them. Um, but yes, let's get started. This will be somewhat of a long ride, so please bear with me. Back in the day, when Julius Caesar returned from his honeymoon with Cleopatra, really, long ride, going to be about Python, I promise. Just <laughs> stay here. Caesar returned from his honeymoon with Cleopatra, and he decided, because he was a great man, and great men I want to do great things, to end the years of confusion. And the years of confusion were actually a feature of the Roman calendar back then because the Roman year was 355 days long, which, as you probably noticed, if you are already awake, uh, that that is 10 days short of our calendar. And because the Romans weren't entirely stupid, they actually noticed that their calendar you know, rotated away from the solar year. Um, and to compensate for that, they just occasionally inserted another month after February. Um, and it was you know, as lax as that. Occasionally, that was inserted, which had a bunch of problems, not least of which the internet was very, very slow back in the day. So <laughs> since the decision on this additional intercalary month was made uh, rather spontaneously a couple of days or weeks ahead, often citizens of the Roman Empire didn't actually know which month they were living in. Since the Romans had invented bureaucracy at that time, that led to a whole bunch of problems, but also this decision, this rather spontaneous decision on whether to add another month was made by the ruling class, so mostly the consuls who were in power. The consuls were in power for one year at a time. You could not be directly re-elected. It was expected that you took like 10 years off or so. So if you're in power for a year, but you can decide how long this year is going to be by inserting another month, you see that there's a very clear temptation, and there were a bunch of years where you had another, an additional month uh, several years in a row. Whereas after that, Rome would go to war, and everybody would kind of forget about calendars because they had better things to do, so they didn't insert. So the year was kind of variable, and everybody was quite unhappy about it. So Caesar went ahead and invited a bunch of mathematicians and astronomers and so on, so people who actually knew what they were doing. And we don't know their names. Their lives aren't really recorded. Um, but they came up with an alternate proposal, and one of which was adopted as the Julian calendar. And it was in use for a very long time after that, and it was basically 365 days a year, and then another additional leap day every four years, which should sound somewhat familiar to you because it's very close to the system we're actually still using. The trouble is, this assumes that your year is 365 days and a quarter day long, which isn't quite correct. It's off by a total amount of nearly 11 minutes. Now, that's an error rate of 0.002% of over the course of a whole year, which might sound like not a lot. I'm, I'm a very humble web developer, and I know that 0.002% uh, sounds like an excellent error rate to me. I'm, 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 Maybe you're all much better developers, but you would agree that this sounds reasonable. Um, unfortunately, they left the Julian calendar on running for a very long time, rather unsupervised. <laughs> I also don't want to know what is going to happen if somebody leaves my you know, web programming tools on for a thousand years. Um, but this is what happened. Europe kind of ran into the dark ages, collectively lost 
her mind forgot how to count and how to read and how to write. Uh, we had some, uh, some monasteries on this very island who, you know, uh, remembered how to write and, and of course, uh, countries outside of Europe who also retained our culture for us, but um, it was bad. So calendars were the farthest from, from everybody's mind. Uh, the year 1000 was celebrated over the course of, I think, a total of nearly 20 years all over Europe because nobody was quite sure what year it was, really. Um, also, another disclaimer, the rest of the talk will be very European-centric because let's just talk about the mess we made at home and, and not how it impacted the rest of the world because apparently I can only talk here for an hour. Not sure what's up with that, but yeah, right. So we're going to stay within Europe. It's more complex than that, of course, and Europe had horrible, horrible impacts on, on the rest of the world at the time, um, but let's not talk about that. Um, anyways, as I said, we recovered from, from the Dark Ages. Things got better, and in the 1500s, um, people actually got around to being interested in, in calendars again and discovered that the year had rotated off the solar year uh, by about 10 days. Now, because, you know, left running unsupervised for 1,500 years, it happens to all of us, I guess. Um, and you might say, well, who cares, right? 10 days off, that's not, it's not like winter is suddenly in summer or anything. And a sensible answer would be that people might value consistency in their calendars. And um, the actual answer is that the date of Easter is, as you probably know, super inconvenient because it's not a fixed date, but it you know, wanders around. It's computed. It's computed off it's the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. It's completely intuitive, I agree. And the spring equinox was just assumed to be March 21st. But, you know, if your calendar rotates off the solar year by 10 days, it's not anymore. So suddenly your date of Easter is wrong. And that was a big deal at the time. Um, so who cared about that? The Pope cared. And what the Pope cared about, you know, nearly all of Europe cared about too. So Pope Gregory XIII, which we see here, who, who we see here, invited you know, a bunch of mathematicians and a bunch of astronomers. Um, this time we actually know their names and I'm not going to bore you with them. But, you know, they, they, they talked a lot and they calculated a lot and they came up with a formula to describe the length of a solar year. This is what it is. So they rediscovered what the uh, ancient Greek mathematicians actually knew 100 years before Caesar, but, you know, as the Romans usually did, they only took part of Greek culture and not the actually important parts. Um, so this needed to be rediscovered. If you put that in, in a form that people can actually use, it, it's a set of rules that goes like this. A year is a leap year, so an additional day will be inserted in February if it is divisible by four, unless if it's divisible by 100, then it's not a leap year, unless it's divisible by 400, then it is a leap year. Those are the new rules. They fit on three lines, which is nice. Um, they have great application for day-to-day -day life because if you're teaching programming students, this is what you use to teach them if-else statements. Um, it's, it's all really well. They didn't really express it in three lines back in the day, though. They were a bit more verbose. So the Pope published a law, a papal bull, which is, is called intergravissimas, um, because those are the first two words in this document. They have absolutely no bearing on the content, but that's how papal laws are named. I'm very happy that we don't name our programs like that, because, you know, intermain is a horrible name for every program ever to have. Um, although I know that some people name their variables more or less like that, you know, the first two words or the first items in there. Um, and so this law was published in, in uh, 1581, and uh, it described how the new calendar was going to work, and it also described how the existing calendar was going to be fixed, because, you know, having a new calendar is great, but you would still be 10 days off the solar calendar, which uh, should be used to, to find the date of Easter. Um, and so the solution uh, Rome and the Pope and his advisors came up with was basically, let's just silently drop 10 days. Let's jump from one day to 10 days later, uh, pretend nothing happened and all will be well. Now, if we look at Europe at the time, we see that Pope Gregory was just a bit late because these were the 1580s and like everybody knows, you know, uh, the, the 
Catholic Church was quite in trouble by then because the decades before that uh, had seen the church splinter into, you know, different Protestant churches, the Anglican Church was formed, and so on. So other than, you know, like 50 years before that, the Pope suddenly didn't have, you know, the absolute say over all of Europe. So when this proposal came about, some countries, the Catholic countries, adopted it, which is uh, Spain and France and, and uh, Poland and the Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And I, I tried to draw up the board as it's, it's horribly complex. European history is, is terrible. Um, so some countries jumped ahead by 10 days, which is why, for example, the, the Holy Theresa of Avila uh, uh, from Spain died on the night from October 4th to October 15th, which sounds like a really protracted long death, but it wasn't. It, 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 you know, it was one night. Um, I'm not sure if this sounds familiar to you yet, so I'm going to try to put this in a different way. We had a fairly technical system that many people were using, and it worked fairly well for everybody involved, but there were technical issues with that. Um, that should be fixed from the point of view of people who were, you know, highly involved in the technical side of it, like the date of Easter. Um, so the person most responsible, the BDFL, or Benevolent Dictator for Life, of the Catholic Church at the time, um, decided, uh, while consulting a lot of advisors, um, to unilaterally change the system and update to a better system that looked superficially very much the same, but some minor technical details were, details were updated to reflect current state of the art. This switch in itself proved to be very, very painful, and people who were either not on board with the new mission or just very skeptical, like fun fact, the Protestant countries actually thought this was a ploy of the Pope to get them back into the Catholic Church. So people who are not politically involved with this person or who are just more conservative, not that the Protestant countries were more conservative than the Catholic Church. Anyways, um, <laughs> dis decided to resist this change, which then led to one continent separated by two systems who look very much the same, but are at the same time horribly inter can't work together. Um, I hope this sounds a bit like the divide between Python 2 and Python 3 to you, um, <laughs> because it sure does for me. Um, so how did people deal with that back then? Because as you probably know, religion was a good cause as any to go to war and you know, different religions like Catholic and Protestant churches, hell yeah, let's go to war. And if you go to war sooner or later, you come up with the peace treaty. And one country has one date, the other country has the other date. What do you put on the treaty? Um, it turns out there was a fairly pragmatical solution to that. It looks like this. You just put in both dates. Today is uh, the 16th of September, according to the new Gregorian calendar. But if we were still living uh, with the Julian calendar, who has wandered off three more days, because you know it happens over time, it would be the 3rd September. Again, if this looks like the conversion between Python 2 and Python 3 to you, it should. I, I hope it should. So, you know, Europe kind of was split for a terribly long time. Like, it took over 100 years for the first other countries to come around. 100 years of divided dates. And some countries proved to be more stubborn than others, which was mostly about, you know, your relationship to the Catholic Church. So um, let's talk about um, this island, whatever it was called at the time. I'm probably going to get this horribly wrong, but let's assume it's called the Kingdom of Great Britain. Um, it's a good example, because uh, they made the switch in 1751. 1751 is, is nearly, nearly 200 years off the first conversion. And the interesting fact is not that it's 200 years off or that they were the last country in, in Western Europe to actually make the switch. The interesting part is that they had a very long law, of course, and, um, which received royal assent in 1751. And it doesn't mention the Catholic Church, the Gregorian calendar, or the Pope Gregory at all. It's a complete standalone version of why we should switch to a new calendar because the old one wanders off the solar year. That's not a good thing. I think this is super impressive as an example of what you know, politics and human stubbornness can do. Um, it does mention, though, that there was a lot of confusion when dealing with mainland Europe, right? Because you had payment dates, but the European mainland would maybe uh, see the payment dates in their calendar, and uh, so 
and you have a battle to contest with. And if we talk about this confusion, we need to talk about Eastern Europe. I didn't talk about Eastern Europe so far because uh, they were um, even less likely to like the Catholic Church. Um, the Orthodox churches which are present in Eastern Europe split off the Catholic Church way earlier than the Protestant churches, like by 500 years. So obviously it also took them nearly 500 years to get around to the Roman Catholic calendar, um, which happened for, for Russia in, in 1918, which is a fun fact why we're talking about the November Revolution, because according to the calendar everybody else was using at the time, it was the October Revolution, but you know, um, not for the Russians. And as you can imagine, if you, if you ha ha spend about 350 years having a different calendar, this is not only Russia, of course, um, countries around Russia uh, did the same thing. Um, I think the last countries to, to uh, use the Gregorian calendar within Europe were Greece in 1922 and then uh, Turkey in 1927. So it really took a long time. And of course, you know, a long time of, of confusion like that is, is produces a lot of funny stories, like when the Olympic Games were still fairly new at being reintroduced, not in very ancient times, um, and were rather unnoticed, a small event, and they took like 80 days. It's really impressive. Um, in 1912, the Russian delegation arrived 12 days late. Just, you know, somebody messed up the invites. Um, but on a more serious note, um, when Napoleon um, kind of, you know, steamrolled all of Europe and uh, became more or less uh, the only important person in Europe, uh, excepting, of course, this, this island, um, he, he marched on uh, a bunch of countries and some of them formed actual alliances against him, which seemed like a good idea at the time. And one of these alliances, or the most important one, was between Austria and Russia. Um, and they made plans where to meet up, how to coordinate, uh, to, to resist uh, uh, Napoleon, and uh, as you can guess from this context, they, they messed up the dates. So th the Austrians marched in, into Bavaria, and the Russians were too far behind to actually support them. This part of, uh, it was not the largest part, but this part of, of the Austrian army was, was uh, decimated, and Napoleon kind of just rolled on, uh, conquered Vienna, and went on to the more or less deciding battle at the time, the, the Battle of Austerlitz. Um, at that time, the Russians had finally arrived, but uh, since their forces were weakened so much, Napoleon kind of just won and carried on into Russia in the winter, which didn't work out for him. Um, uh, but you see, this, this calendar thing has, has serious consequences. Um, one last example, and I promise we're going to leave calendars alone after that. Sweden was a Protestant country, so they resisted the new calendar for a time. But when parts of what would later become Germany and, and the Netherlands and so on made the switch in, in 1700, they decided to, yeah, let's do that. And they looked around and they were like, you know, just dropping 10 days seems like a really bad idea. We like our continuity. What if we have, you know, four loops running over dates? They are going to break. Um, so they decided to instead just drop all the leap days for 40 years, every four years, until their calendar had arrived at the Gregorian calendar. Which seems like a horrible idea, right? Because your date changes every four years in relation to both the countries with the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar. <laughs> no way you're going to get that straight. So they did that in, in 1700. In 1700, they didn't have a leap day. Um, but then they had a new king who was very young, so all the surrounding countries were like, hey, a young, unexperienced king, let's go to war. Didn't even use religion. Uh, um, so in 1704, they were kind of busy being at war, and as the Romans, being at war means you don't really care about your calendars, so they just had a leap day. Um, 178 rolls around, and again, they just had a leap day, because, you know, it's what you do. The war ended, and they looked around and found themselves off one day the Julian calendar and 10 days off the Gregorian calendar and said, you know, let's fix that. What's the most logical way to fix that? The most logical way to fix that is in the next leap year to insert a second leap day, <laughs> making for the one and only February 13th to go back to the Julian calendar and carry on like that for another 40 years until they just 
got just ahead of, of the United of Great Britain in making the switch in uh, 1750. So uh, may, maybe you didn't run into adoption stories of Python 3 like that, which means you, uh, I, I envy you, really, because I've seen that. Let's try to switch slowly. Oh, no, now our systems are clashing with each, with each other and they can't talk to each other. Let's go back. No, now let's try this again. Switching between complex systems is a thing. And I'm not saying that this translates entirely directly to our experience with Python 3. Um, if only the Python core team had studied absurd European history, you know, they would have known how to handle this. Um, and to be fair, it also doesn't look like we're in for 300 years of Python 2 support at this point because we're sunsetting Python 2 and there's a chance of this not taking actually 300 years. Um, what, what I want to say is that most things that happen to humans happen to us because we are messy, complex, charged, chemically charged people who don't really know what they're doing. Um, so we form patterns in history, and those patterns tend to repeat. Of course, we can't know ahead of time which pattern is going to repeat, which is a major problem, admittedly. But history is filled with stories like these, and I think we do well to pay attention to that. Um, but because this was very funny and also an example of uh, human screwing up, I actually want to give you an example of humans getting it right, and I want to give Sweden a chance at redemption. Um, because, you see, Sweden um, was a bit of a special case with regards to traffic in Europe when people starting, started driving cars, or what passed for cars at the time. And uh, the special case was that they drove on the left. I have no idea where they got that idea from. It seems like a horrible idea to me. For, uh, uh, so the special case was not, was not really driving on the left, but they drove on the left, but they also had their steering wheels on the left because they wanted to you know, uh, trade with Europe and, and um, basically nearly all other countries. Um, uh, so they used uh, mainland European cars, but drove on the left. Um, that's really useful if you are a delivery person because you can just jump out of the car and start, you know, uh, delivering things, but other than that, it's pretty horrible because you see less of the road, it's more dangerous. It's, it's, if you've ever driven a car on the side of the road it wasn't meant for, you will know that it's a weird experience, even weirder than just driving on the other side of the road. Um, so um, there had been the idea for a very long time to just you know, s switch to the same side as everybody else because you know, they had more problems with it than, than an isolated island would have, theoretically because they actually share a very, very long border with Norway. It's, it's a big country, and there was actually one road that passed from Norway into Sweden, then back again, and they had an exemption to just keep driving on the right, because it seemed like a very, very horrible idea to switch in between. So the idea of switching uh, to, to right-side traffic had been around since the 30s, but then, you know, another war came, so people were less interested in uh, changing the tr side of the road. Tanks drove on, basically. Um, and uh, it was postponed for a bit. Uh, then the 50s rolled around and committees started to take interest, so that took a long time, as you can imagine. Um, but by the 60s, they were ready to, to start actually working on the switch. Um, they had a referendum about it. As you can imagine, everybody was super against it because if you'd ask me if I wanted to start driving on the other side of the road tomorrow, I would be like, no, what? <laughs> um, so uh, the, the populace said no with an 85% referendum, but there was a fairly low attendance rate of like 50%, which was fairly bad for Sweden at the time. So they decided to switch regardless. <laughs> and not commentary, I said so, right? <laughs> Um, and I, I, I'm just going to uh, take, uh, spoiler the result. There were absolutely no uh, spikes in accident rates due to that switch. And I want to examine how they did that because it seems super unlikely to me, changing a whole country, even in the 60s when you had less traffic than today, uh, to another system of driving seems like it would produce a huge amount of accidents. Um, so they had a bunch of approaches that worked really well for them combined. First off, they figured out what they were dealing with. They tested people on their, actually knowledge, uh, their actual knowledge of the rules of the road and how competent they were at driving, um, and also how they would react to driving on the other side, which yielded 
totally surprising results, like the better the, a driver you are, the better you cope with driving on the other side of the road. Um, but still, they, they made sure to test these assumptions, because you can't actually be sure, right? What if an experienced driver is so set in their ways that they can't cope with being on the other side? Um, and they actually took this opportunity to introduce a whole bunch of other traffic rules, because you know, if you have to educate people, do it right. Um, so they introduced global speed limits and, and special rules for right-of-way and stuff like that. Um, and they made the people who would interact with people on the road the most, so mostly the military and the police, practice on separate stretches of road so that they would be proficient by the time they switched. Also, they had learned from their previous mistakes of switching over the course of 40 years and decided to not do that and instead switch on a single day. Um, but they spent an inordinate amount of time and money uh, and effort to record training materials, both for the radio, the TV, written materials, instructions. And uh, they thought ahead in terms of, for example, selling cars. Um, back in the day, it just started that cars had asymmetrical headlights, right? Your headlights are not exactly the same because you want to look far ahead, but you don't want to blind oncoming traffic. So the outside headlight is a bit higher and the inside headlight is just a bit lower. Um, so they started selling cars with asymmetrical headlights, but put on a bit of masking tape to avoid blinding oncoming traffic, and you could just remove that tape when the day of the switch arrived, which seems all, you know, very clever and well thought through. And all of this was a centralized effort at that time, so the training materials were centralized, and considerations about, you know, how to build and sell cars were naturally centralized too. But then, um, and they, they had a, a logo, and like, there was CI for this, right? You, you could tell people, this is the logo, and there will be a switch, and you will drive on the right. This is good. And uh, then they deferred to more local, regional, and decentralized processes by uh, giving things over to, to, to local communities, which then would distribute the, the uh, education materials in like door-to-door -door visits and at gas stations, because that's where everybody comes through. So they distributed, like, uh, there were special driver's gloves, because back in the day we were stylish and we had driver's gloves. And one was right and other, the other was green to remind people which side to drive on, which is not very inclusive of people who are colorblind, but it's a good effort, is what I'm saying. Um, and they also had, you know, uh, lessons everywhere available. All of that was available for free, so nobody had to pay to get that. And it was, you know, basically six months of, of a very strong information campaign. Um, there was even a, a radio hit that was Keep Right Svensson, too. You know. um, it, it, it was a national effort. So on the day itself, they had a whole lot of people on the roads. There were, at night, 20,000 people, it's, it's a very large country, um, to, to uh, unveil new road signs on the right side of the road, because you expect your road signs on your driving side, and also signs that reminded people to drive on the other side of the road. And then they had about like nearly 10,000 people from the military and the police with cars and even a couple of aircraft uh, standing around uh, just being available and ready to jump in and help. Uh, and what's even more impressive, they had 150,000 volunteers who were around in the cities and towns to guide pedestrians because they were very aware that traffic is not just cars and not just vehicles on the road, but also pedestrians. And if the cars suddenly come from the wrong side, as you know, I discovered when I came to Cardiff, uh, that's very confusing. <laughs> and so having a lot of volunteers who just guide you and remind you, and by the way, the cars are here now. Um, so the actual switch happened like that at about 10 to 5 a.m. on a Sunday morning, so at a time where very few people were on the road, everybody had to stop and then very, very slowly and carefully drive to the other side and wait until 10 minutes were over so that everybody had a chance. There was a countdown on the radio and everything. And then you would be allowed to continue driving very slowly and carefully. And as I said, no spike in accidents, no, no no real accidents actually related to this. I mean, there was a drunk driving accident where the driver drove on the wrong side, but he was already drunk driving, so, right. And, but, but we can take from this that, that careful planning coupled with actual research and then active education can help you switch from one system to another that are nearly the same but utterly incompatible, requiring a painful switch. I think I'm repeating myself here. Um, 
So, but my, but my point is we, we can learn things from the past, especially things that refer to us humans being, you know, weird and complex and communication being hard. Um, people in the software industry, and I, I mean this inclusive of me, we people in the software industry um, somehow tend to think that we are the first to encounter things. Um, this is maybe because it's a new medium, so it's, you know, but not even everything you encounter on a computer screen is new. Um, and uh, that there are so many examples for this that it's hard to pick and choose. There's, for instance, something that seems very uh, computer and internet specific is this saying, the internet does not forget, which first off isn't quite true if you ever try to retrieve something that you saw like 20 years ago on the internet. That's nearly impossible, um, unless you get very lucky. Um, but also, it's, it's a horrifying concept, right? If the internet doesn't forget and we have these huge amounts of misinformation on the internet, then that's a huge problem we need to deal with. Are we the first to deal with this problem? You know my answer. Um, so I want to go into the German language. The German language is pretty horrible to learn. You probably shouldn't do that if you haven't already started. And if you have started, you might want to reconsider because there are lovely other languages around. But we can do one thing really well, and that's words that describe concepts which you otherwise would have to explain in long, long sentences or stories. This is one of these words, it's pronounced Verballhornen, and it means to take something and to garble it until it's still vaguely recognizable and funny, but also unusable. Uh, a, 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 an example for that is, is um, in, in the Roman mass, uh, which is traditionally in Latin, there is a part where, the very, very important part anyway, is the priest stands there and says, hoc est corpus, which might seem a lot like hocus pocus, which it is. Um, they, they took this, they garbled it, and now it's, you know, magic. Um, magic happened. Um, and the history of this word is, is super absurd. Back in the day, we, we had, and by back in the day, I mean, you know, we're jumping through history, it's fine. Um, we had the Hanseatic League, which was basically a confederation of free cities and merchants and whatever in, in, in northern Europe around the Baltic Sea. Um, they had their own laws, they even had their own army. Like, they went to war with Denmark, and they didn't lose. Um, and trading bases everywhere, the steel yard in London. And they had different laws, but basically there was one very important law, the law of Lübeck, the city of Lübeck, which was then used in plenty of other cities around, like nearly 100. And then in, in the 1500s, the German language changed very quickly from something that sounds very archaic to us and that, uh, to something that sounds basically what we're speaking now. Um, and it changed so fast that we needed translations from older works to newer works over a fairly short amount of time. So the city of Lübeck decided to you know, translate their laws so that it, they could still be in use everywhere, uh, which was done by the city council. And they printed it, uh, distributed it everywhere, and it turned out that translation was horrible. It was unusable. Like, there were parts wrong, there were parts missing. You just couldn't use it to run a city. Um, and maybe knowing what they were doing, they hadn't put their own names on the book. The only name to be found on the title page of the book was the name of the printer, Johann Balhorn, whose name then went on to mean, you know, to take something and to change it until it was completely unusable, but funny. So the internet doesn't forget, but neither did we earlier, and we also retained misinformation in horrible ways. There are still people named Balhorn in Germany, and I'm very sorry for them. <laughs> um, or, but you might say, well, yeah, but that's humans, right? Humans have memories, and they get things wrong, and we know that. That's not new. Come on. Um, but this applies to other concepts, too. Like, there is something that might sound very technical, uh, which is high-frequency trading, right? Computers are very, very fast. They make decisions that in, in time frames that we can't even begin to work with. Um, and the faster you are, the higher are the chances, maybe, that you can make a profit of it. Um, so when, again, back in the day, the telegraph was introduced, one of the first uses of the telegraph in France was to you know, send messages faster than your competition uh, to the degree that they just sent messages by, oh, we made a typo there, and the typo would be meaningful for some people at the stock exchange, so they would know ahead of time what was happening and what to do to make a profit. And that got even worse when the telegraph was adopted across uh, Europe. 
this picture is basically of a telephone exchange, but it's the best I could find. And it shows the complexity of, of those offices at the time because they were highly interlinked technologies. Um, so there was the London Stack Exchange and the huge London Telegraph office. And they were really close together, like 200 meters, yards, whatever. Um, and people discovered that it could to take a bit of time to send a message to the stock exchange because all traffic within London was routed through the central telegraph office, which means uh, somebody had to transcribe it off the wire, then route it to the correct other wire, then you know put it on the wire again. And it was faster to just take the message at the central telegraph office and run over through the stack exchange, which would again give you an advantage over the competition because you were faster than them which in turn led to a, a pneumatic tube system being installed between those two locations, because that's, again, faster than people running and would grant some people a monopoly on having the news first, and uh, which they then sold as basically the first form of the news ticker that we had. Um, so you see, these, these concepts are not new. They arise again and again. Like, the oldest building, the literally oldest building in Germany that is still standing is a castle in the middle of nowhere. Basically, we're not quite sure how old it is, but it's older than a thousand years, which is good for Germany. And so if you read the history of this castle, in the 1300s, the nearest city tried to, to uh, take the castle. It's very heroic and very medieval. They tried in vain. They stood around the castle for years and years, but they didn't get in and so on. Um, so 50 years later, they just bought it. They acquired the castle. It's, it's a hostile takeover. It's an acquiry. It's, it's not a new concept. It's been around for over 700 years. You know, it's been around longer than that, but people don't change that much. So as a result, our actions don't change that much. Things that might look like, like startup culture and, and, and very, you know, something we need to discuss, and we do need to discuss it, aren't that new. Which is kind of my point. Most things that happen are not conceptually new. That's a thought that is not new itself, right? Like there were ancient Greek philosophers who were like, there's nothing new under the sun. And I'm sure you agree, nothing has changed since then. So things, of course, change. And there are new things. But we tend to overestimate how much of the things we encounter are actually new and how much have been there before us. Because people have been there before us. They have encountered problems. They have muddled through somehow. Sometimes their solutions became then the canonical solutions, um, even though it was just you know, people muddling through somehow. Um, so the software industry has started to realize that this is a thing we do. It's often called not invented here syndrome. It's when you know, there are tools available for the job, but they weren't even invented here, or they are not quite the perfect fit. And instead of uh, adapting them, you just write your own. Which, you know, as, as Daniela said, I wrote pre-talks. It's used to submit talks to conferences and then schedule them. It's not that there wasn't any other system around before that. It's not even that there wasn't any open source system around before that. It's just that I used them and I wasn't happy. And you know, submitting a talk to a conference is just filling in a form, and then people can fill in other forms. So how hard can it really be? And I think, I think most of us have been there. Right? We, we have a good idea, and others might have had it, but not as good as us. And anyways, we're going to implement it ourselves. And I think we should discuss, as a community, what we can and should do about that. Because re-implementation has its place. It's, it actually has several places. It's really good for learning things. Like uh, the Python standard library gives us a whole lot of inbuilds that are tremendously useful and often are things that you see in older programming books as tasks, and like uh, check if this string is in another string. And in Python, you're like, yes, string in other string. That's actually how we check that. Um, and for your production system, I hope you wouldn't uh, consider re-implementing this substring check. Um, but trying to uh, implement that yourself 
to learn about is, is actually a very, very good idea because it might seem uh, simple at first, but it really isn't. A lot of very, very clever people have written a lot of very, very clever papers about optimizing this process of checking if one string is in another string, and that's not even talking about, you know, if two strings are in another string or if a regex matches a string, which we heard about at this conference, and is, is terrifying, really. Um, so one, one use of, of implementing things, again, is to learn about them, to study them. But even then, the best use of your time is to either before or after implementing your own solution to check other people's solution, to see what's out there, to learn about their concepts. Um, the other use, of course, is that evaluating other solutions may not always be worth it, or adapting other solutions may not always be worth it. Um, because there's a huge cost just associated with finding out about other solutions. When somebody tells me, we need a CRM, can you recommend one? I'm like, that's, that's too much. Can you, can you just narrow the scope a bit? But even with a narrowed scope, right, there are thousands of those around. And how do you find one that actually applies to you? And at which point is it not worth your time to look through other people's solutions? It's, it's a trade-off. Um, so when people implement things themselves, it's not, it's never basically out of malice. And it's also rarely, or not always, out of ignorance. It's often because they have pain points that wouldn't be solved by other people's solutions, either because they're too expensive in time or effort or understanding, um, or for other reasons. So that's something you need to talk about. If you see somebody doing that, don't go, well, that's been done before. Be like, are you aware that there are, you know, there's prior art for that? Have you looked at that? In which way isn't that good for you? Um, because we need to be attentive to that. Um, what's, what's the solution to this problem? In, in an ideal world, I would tell you to, you know, read all the books, consume all of human knowledge, and then you will know what to do, hopefully. Sadly, we live in time and space, and our lives are constrained by both of them, so this isn't really a practical solution. Um, our solution needs to be somewhat imperfect, and my, my best suggestion for that is to broaden your horizons, because the more you know about parallels and prior art, previous experiences of people, the more you know, the more you have vaguely heard of, and the more the people around you know and have heard of, provided that you actually talk to the people around you, will give you more context to work on problems and to place your problems in a wider context. Um, so in very practical terms, go, go to meetups, or find, find a medium or mediums of choice that work for you. For example, go to meetups talk to people there. Go to conferences like this one. Like the, talking to people here is, is as easy as it gets for most people because everybody here is very friendly and here to talk to you. So walking up to somebody and saying, hey, which talks did you see? Did you enjoy something specifically? And then going from there can be hard, I know that, but it's relatively easy here and you will meet brilliant people. Um, Read blog posts. There are so many good blogs out there. Ask people, again, for, for recommendations or, or find your own. Um, and there are interactive blog posts and, and different styles, which is super helpful. Um, read books, if that's your thing. Um, but there's so much other stuff out there. There are podcasts that are tremendously helpful because they can convey what people actually know and feel in terms of contextual knowledge, which is often lost in, in books. Um, there are video series, and again, some, some things here might work for you and some won't, but there are brilliant video series and tutorials out there which will convey a lot of knowledge. And then there are new opportunities. There are, you know, just people who are super knowledgeable uh, are on Twitch and stream their coding stuff and just talk about what they're doing. That's a tremendous resource if that's something you can work with. Um, there are educational games out there, and there are new media developing, and we should be aware of that. But that's just the medium. The more important part that I really want you to consider is talk across professional and cultural boundaries. 
if you are, like me, a web developer and work more in the front end or more in the back end, talk to the people on the other side. Uh, I'm more of a back end person, so I try to talk to people who work the front end because that's often somewhat alien to me, but it's super interesting to see their challenges and the, how they react. If, if you use Python and you are more on the data science side of things, talk to the web people because they run into problems that are often not the same as yours, but can be very interesting in terms of how they approach them. Same the other way around, of course. If you are a web developer, find out what a research software engineer does and is, and it might be way more interesting than you might think at first. If you are part of the Python community, make sure to actually interact with other communities out there. Like, the Rust community is a great example because they are really good at talking about um, their community governance and how they move their language forward in a way that people can actually work with them and can join a working group. And because off the top of my head, I wouldn't know what I would do if I wanted to actually get a new feature into Python. I know that there are mailing lists involved and, and PEP and, uh, PEPs, Python enhancement proposals, but that's basically the range of my knowledge. Um, the Rust community is very, very explicit in many ways and very inviting, and they have a lot of dialogue on how to handle that. Oh, I mean, the JavaScript community um, talks a lot about packaging because they do a lot of packaging. We don't have to agree with how they do their packaging, but it's definitely interesting to learn from their decisions and from the problems they encountered as a result, sure. Um, and, of course, if, if you are a programmer, talk to the people you interact with. Talk to your managers about the problems they faced. We had a great talk about that yesterday here. Um, talk to the technical writers about the problems they encounter when they work with you or within their culture. Um, because those are cultures that interact with you but are different. I'm speaking from experience here, and they, they have great conferences or meetups or blog posts or whatever you want to choose to interact. But Try it. Um, as software people, we should talk to people in other industries. Civil engineering is super fascinating. Or pe people in healthcare and so on, they face unique challenges in their line of work, which are super interesting to us if we only you know, think to talk to them. And it goes further than that. Like, If you are a very structured person, um, it, it is very good and helpful to talk to very creative people because they think very differently, and they come up with cool stuff which will be super useful to you. On, and the other way around, if you are a very creative person, it can be very useful to talk to people who are very structured because it will give you different insights into the work you're actually doing. Um, for programmers, for example, that people who do stuff with formal methods are super interesting. They, they are also not at all how my brain works, which is why I like reading what they're doing, because reading is my medium of choice. And it, of course, goes further than that. Like in, in a community like this, it, it more or less goes without saying, but I'll say it anyways. You should, of course, interact with generally people who are just not copies of yourself in most ways and then different in one or two ways. People from different backgrounds, upbringings, countries, continents, genders, and so on. If you make sure to broaden your horizons in these ways, you will have a lot of contextual knowledge in your head, but also in your community to draw on when you encounter a problem, which will help you with, you know, when you stand in front of a problem and don't even know how to phrase it, much less how to look it up, because it's just a huge unknown. You can talk to different people about it and see if they have encountered something similar, because chances are there is something at least vaguely related out there. So history repeats its patterns, even though we can't know ahead of time which patterns are going to be repeated. But if we pay a bit of attention and talk to one another, I think we can use that if we find, and if we find out what has been done before. Uh, we can focus even more on the aspects of our work that are actually new. Let's go and try that. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Tobias, for your contribution to this conference here on the stage now, but also over the last uh, few months. Thank you so much. Once again, please. <laughs> wonderful. Really wonderful. Thank you. Um,